Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I finally managed to get the uh, new mount outside with my GT81 and did some calibration testing. I didn't do any imaging, I just wanted to test out the mount to see how it was behaving in terms of PHD2 calibration, guiding, periodic error correction, all the usual suspects that we do to our mounts when we first start working with them. And this was my first time also to use GSS and the new software arrangement that I've got to deal with having switched over from the Sea Gym to the Skywatcher. I just can't stand these little tiny handles here for the counterweights. There are there, there two 11 pound counterweights and I just don't trust these things to be able to tighten them enough so that they bear into the shaft and hold the weight. So uh, to avoid the potential disaster that can come if these weights drop down and hit the restraint at the end of the counterweight shaft, I purchased a shaft collar here. Some of you are providing some excellent comments, but there's one irritating thing about YouTube is they don't let links into comments. So if you're putting a link to something that I would probably find very useful, your comment is being deleted by YouTube. If you're responding to one of these videos in a YouTube channel, you might do some things to trick up the way you enter a link in the question so that YouTube doesn't delete them. What I've done is, is buy a shaft collar here. Now you can get a real cheap one, and this one is from Amazon. It has an 18 millimeter bore to match the diameter of the shaft here. The one I got, uh, the one that Amazon is selling here is really cheap. It's $6.54. That's not bad at all. It's a carbon steel collar. It has black oxide coating, so that inhibits some corrosion, but there is a chance of corrosion eventually. But still, at $6.54, um, that's certainly well worth the money to buy a clamp like this. Now, there are some clamps that have a set screw that goes perpendicular to the shaft. In other words, it would dig into the shaft, so I didn't like that. I like this side-mounted or tangentially mounted screw here that allows you to wrap the collar and around the shaft and then that distributes the friction force uniformly around and it doesn't scar the shaft. Another option and the one that I did go with is this stainless steel version. It's a lot more expensive. It's from Ruland. You can look them up on the web. But I have a lot more confidence when balancing the scope and finally setting the, the weights on to just put this collar on and tighten it up and, and I don't worry at all about this thing slipping. And with this tangential screw, as I mentioned, you don't, uh, you, there's no fear of, of scarring up your, your counterweight shaft. The first thing you have to do, of course, is do the polar alignment. I'm using the uh, pole master and that fits fine and one of the problems that I know people comment on is this uh, back end altitude adjustment knob here. This is like an M16 thread. This is an M12 thread up here for this other side. Your azimuth adjustment of course is a knob here and on the other side and these are bearing up a vertical pin that's inside that's uh, screwed into the top of the tripod. I found that uh, working with and making adjustments with these knobs wasn't that bad. It turned out I was able to achieve a pretty good polar alignment and even though I do plan on putting some perhaps some lithium grease between this interface here and on these threads I found that this thing worked pretty well and the stock knobs were not bad for uh, a kind of a, a cooler night so I wasn't having to worry about having sweaty hands adjusting these these small knobs. So all in all, polar alignment went just fine. And of course, once you get done with polar alignment, it's time to first uh, do some calibration with PHD2. And it's a good idea to pick a star that's up near the meridian and near the celestial equator so you can decouple the motion in RA and deck. And I picked a star or the field uh, near Altair, which at the time I started was back here more towards the corner of the meridian and the celestial equator. And when I did the calibration, I got some very uh, comforting results with the uh, orthogonal axes in the deck and RA uh, motion and also a nice linear trend in these data points that it's collecting. I'm doing a guide speed around 0.8 times. I think you want to do a higher guide speed if you're, if you're ultimately going to be using deck backlash compensation. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, I use about 0.8 times the sidereal rate and uh, got pretty good results, which if you recall what led me to go down this path of getting this new mount, these were the results I was getting most recently, uh, not the entire time, but most recently with my CGEM. And you can see these, this data, this format doesn't look anything like the kind of thing you would like to expect here. Now, this does not 
this is not what I used to get every time I, I did a calibration with my CGEM. This was just the very recent results. In the past, the, res the calibration results looked pretty much like this here. Calibration results look pretty good. Their orthogonality is great. Uh, linearity, the, the data points fall along the line. So one of the things that I'm interested in is what is the worm period of this worm gear, the RA worm gear here in, in for this mount as opposed to what I had with my CGEM. These are the results. I let it go for a long time. The results up here, are the, the suggestion up here is to let it go for a couple of minutes. Uh, but in fact, uh, if you're trying to characterize the worm period you want to let it go for maybe three periods of that which is around 1500 seconds and as you can see here i went for about 2000 seconds and that gave me some decent data to um, classify how what my scene looks like and it looks like it's about almost 0.4 arc seconds of course that doesn't include any mount mechanical contribution of that that's just the star motion the second thing is it tells you if you do you have this measure back, uh, declination backlash tick it'll do a backlash check and calculate how long it takes to recover for declination backlash and this is the curve i got ideally when you're backing coming back north you should follow this white set of dots and instead I overshoot that and come down and that's what led to a fairly high declination backlash of 2.65 seconds and then finally the guiding assistant tells you what its estimate for your polar alignment is and in this case it came up with a 1.3 arc minutes. I was actually a little disappointed I'd say given that I'm we have belt drives in this Skywatcher mount I was hoping that the deck backlash would be significantly reduced and it, it is better uh, than the CGM, but it's it's not as as good as uh, as I was hoping for. I wanted to program the mount using the Green Swamp Server uh, periodic or permanent periodic error correction. It's very easy to use once you're in guiding mode. So you selected a star and you're guiding. You can come down here and click on Peck Training, and then this will turn green. And then you just sit back and wait until finally it collects enough data to uh, tell you when it's done. This turns off, the PEC training turns off, and then you can click on this guy to turn uh, the periodic error correction on to see what the effect is. All of the calculations appear to be done within the GSS software, and it reprograms your mount, sends the data to the mount for periodic error correction, and it does a pretty good job. For example, here's what I got before and after periodic error correction training. If you look at this blue curve, now I've eliminated the trends here due to, due to polar alignment error, but this blue curve here represents the motion of the RA axis before I did any uh, permanent periodic error correction. And if you look at the span here, this, this orange curve is just a curve, a simple sinusoidal curve fit to the data. You can see that the worm period is 473 seconds, which is almost identical to what it is for my CGM. I think that was something like 478, if I'm not mistaken. And then the amplitude, peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, is about 18 arc seconds. And I was kind of surprised that it's, again, that much higher. But again, it's the mount's the same price point as the CGM. So, yeah, they're more or less mechanically identical. And that's about the kind of number I would get from my CGM is about 18 arc seconds. If you look at this green curve, this is after I engaged the periodic error correction and let the redid the guiding assistant so that it could collect all this data for me. And you can see that there's a significant reduction in this uh, primary uh, periodic error coming from the fundamental worm period and uh, the overall reduction is about 90 percent so it did a, a good job and I, I recommend that after you do the periodic error correction you go ahead and do another guiding assistant run to take a look at the data because this is confirmation that the periodic error correction is in fact implemented properly I wanted to compare the results with the results I got from before the training and I got this and it's there's some surprising results and some not surprising results. First of all, it's it's not surprising at all that the deck backlash number is the same because we didn't do anything with the deck backlash. Adjusting the periodic error in the RA axis doesn't do anything to help you with deck backlash. So that number shouldn't change and it didn't change. The surprising thing is that the polar alignment error that uh, the guiding assistant estimated initially at 1.3 arc minutes 
was 0.5 arc minutes afterwards. And it's at a slightly different location in the sky because that area of the sky with Altair was continuing to move to the west and to set. So I was in a bit of a different area of the sky, but it wasn't radically different. Uh, so I'm surprised that there was that much difference. Um, I suppose another number, and maybe I just don't understand what these guys are doing in the guiding assistant, I would have expected this right ascension peak to peak motion, 24 arc seconds peak to peak, would have been significantly reduced, and it has been significantly reduced, but I expected a much smaller number over here in the right ascension peak to peak, and here it's reported as 29, which is slightly higher than what it was before. So I don't know where it's getting this number. I don't know if it's just not correcting for RA drift due to polar alignment error or what, but it makes it doesn't make any sense when you consider these results. Clearly, with the PEC uh, in place and correcting for the motion, I'm not getting anywhere near the kind of range of motion that I was getting out of the RA axis without periodic error correction. So I don't know why these results seem to suggest that it's worse or at least on par with, equivalent to what it was before the PEC training. That's probably a question I need to throw over the fence to the, the guys at PhD2 guy and to ask what that number is and how to interpret it, because I did expect that number to be a lot less. And another thing to be careful of, when we're looking at the guiding assistant to tell us what our polar alignment error is, this seems to be a lot of variability here that I'm not expecting based on the drift rate. There's no reason why the drift rate should have changed uh, significantly, this significantly, uh, from this first set of measurements to these measurements. They weren't taken all that far apart in time. And of course, I had not even touched the mount in between, so I don't know why those numbers are different. I went ahead and tested the multi-star guiding, although I am using the uh, off-axis guider. It's a 385 millimeter focal length for the scope, so I'm looking through just a small portion of the sky. Uh, but still, there were enough stars here for it to grab onto for the multi-star guiding. And one of the surprising things, something I probably need to take a look at, uh, having nothing to do with the mount, is the star's a bit elongated. I'm pretty sure I have the field flattener set right, or at least it was last year. I may need to go back in and check to make sure that the, that the field is still flat. When you're looking at a guide star through an off-axis guider, by definition, you're looking at the outer perimeter of the light cone. And this may be an indication that I've got to do some additional adjustment with my field flattener on that William Optics GT81. Another thing that uh, could cause this is some tilt in the guide camera. It's just one set screw that you tighten to grip the guide camera in, a, in the off-axis guider. And so that could induce some tilt that could be responsible for that elongated looking guide star. The effect of an elongated guide star on guiding is probably not that significant. The algorithm is trying to look for a centroid of brightness and uh, yeah, one direction is longer than the other, but I don't think that really should affect uh, too much uh, the algorithm and impair the guiding. If you just look at that graph, you think that looks pretty good. And I think for the most part it is. It's very promising. Uh, the RA error is 0.51 arc seconds RMS, which is, I think, pretty good. Uh, remember from the previous the guiding assistant estimate of uh, noise is about 0.4. RMS, so having a little extra left over for uh, mechanical gear noise and whatnot uh, to bring it up to 0.5 in the RA, total error of 0.5 in the RA axis is probably not that bad. This is better than what I was getting, certainly with the CGEM. What is worse, though, than what I would get with the CGEM is that I'm seeing a 0.63 arc second RMS in the deck axis. Now, that just doesn't make any sense. So this is probably telling me that the guiding parameters in the uh, deck guiding algorithm uh, needs some adjustment because the the RA axis is the one that has the mechanical contribution plus the seeing contribution. Deck really should only be seeing the seeing contribution with very little contribution from mechanical noise because you're not actually moving in the deck axis except for minor uh, minor corrections. What this is saying is the corrections that are being made for deck guiding a bit too aggressive, and I need to, to tone that down quite a bit. And I think that should be achievable. I'm sure I can make some changes to the guiding algorithm in the deck uh, on the deck axis and bring that around to bring that down to about 0.25 arc second RMS, and then I'll have a total of about 0.57 arc second RMS, and I'd be absolutely thrilled if I could get that, especially when you consider that this is a, 
a pulling this this mount right out of the box and throwing it out in the backyard with no uh, tuning whatsoever. The mount is working and it's working fairly well. The the PHD2 calibration went very smoothly. It got good orthogonality. The linear trend of data points on the RA and deck axes were uh, matched the line very well. So uh, you have good confidence that you're getting a good calibration uh, right out of the box with the mount. It turns out the, the mount, again, has about the same worm period and periodic error as the, my CGM, so that has not really changed, and maybe you shouldn't expect too big of a change given that both of these mounts are about the same price range, so you're not going to expect a miracle of manufacturing and one mount and not the other. You're going to get about the same kind of performance. The PEC training I found with GSS was very easy. That went uh, extremely smoothly, and much more so than in my past experience of doing PEC training with the CGEM. Reduced the primary periodic error by 90%. The RA guiding I got right out of the box is, is pretty good at 0.5 arc seconds. I think it was a pretty nice night outside. I think seeing was reasonably good, certainly for here. Uh, so I'm I'm pretty happy with that, and usually the RA guiding should be the worst, uh, but unfortunately unfortunately for me on this night, the uh, deck guiding was worse. But I suspect that this is uh, coming from some guiding parameters within PHD2. It's just a, being a bit too aggressive perhaps with the backlash compensation, and I can tone, that, tone the aggressiveness down quite a bit and hopefully get the deck correction well below what the RA is. I found the deck backlash to be surprisingly high. I was I was maybe a bit too optimistic, but the uh, the backlash is better than the CGM, but it's not uh, remarkably better. And I was hoping that the belt drives were going to give me a belt drive on the deck axis was going to give me a, a much better performance than uh, what I was getting from just the mechanical gear mesh that I have with the CGM. But I think I'm pretty happy with the mount just given that I just took it out of the box and didn't do any tuning. And I think I'll try to do some imaging and play with this deck guiding issue uh, before I try to do anything uh, mechanically by tuning the EQ6. I know there are some good uh, references out there in YouTube for folks who have done this for here, uh, clear skies, and uh, let's get out there and do some imaging, guys. See ya.